Okay, we're, we're, we're recording. Great, okay. Um, so this is Gary Bella, chair of the uh, advisory committee for non-voting taxpayers. I'll use the term ACNVT from, from the rest of this little talk. Um, so let's see that all members, uh, I, we should notify, uh, mention the names of all of the members. So let's go down the list. We have um, uh, Peter Kahn, present, say yes. Peter. Yes, yes. Peter Hale. Yes. Kathy Baird. Yes. Bill Gardner. Yes. Lou Bassano. Here. And myself. Donald Green is not on yet. Did he respond, Kathy? Uh, let me go check. And also on the with us today is Vince Murphy, the Coastal, Coastal Resiliency Coordinator for the Town of Nantucket. Good morning. We're expecting one more outside speaker. Good morning, Vince. So this is an open meeting of the ACNVT. It's being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting, I put down May, feature public comment. I don't know if any member of the public is on this call. For this meeting, ACNVT is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Uh, I, uh, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Also, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. And if for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Or maybe, yep. Okay, so that is the required notice that uh, all of us are getting, reading and getting read to uh, these days. Uh, so let's turning to the agenda. The first order of business is the approval of the agenda. Uh, has everyone seen a copy of the agenda? Would you like Kathy to she screen share or are you all familiar with it? Just nod your head, I'll see. Yeah, I, I think we're familiar with it and it seems to me we're better off looking at you than the agenda. Okay, great, okay. So we, we, you've all seen the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is, um, by the way, Tucker Holland, are you there? 
I saw your name come up somewhere, but I don't know if you're trying to reach me or what. Um, he's here. I just, oh, he's I just here uh, apologize. I stepped out of the room to get some paper. And I oh, didn't okay. See him. Okay. We now have Bill Sherman as well. Oh, great. Oh, great. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. So that means that we have a quorum. That's great. I just want to mention, good morning, Tucker. Good morning. Uh, so I just want to manage everyone's expectations. So we have, we're really fortunate this morning. We have two speakers who are going to talk to us on two important subjects. Actually, Tucker could talk on the third one, but I'm not sure we'll have the time to do that. Um, uh, and um, I'm hoping that all of you understand that we schedule these meetings for 10 o'clock. Um, we hope them to be, they're certainly over by 12 o'clock. Sometimes they're an hour and a quarter, sometimes they're an hour and a half. But I hope you'll be able to hang in there because one of the items, uh, our second item with uh, Vince is, uh, I'm, I'm looking for some, uh, for a resolution and we need that quorum for that. So with that uh, background, uh, let me ask for approval of the minutes of July 11th. They were posted on the website. Anyone want to make that motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, you can raise your hands. If I see all the hands raised, I don't have to call everybody's name. My hands up. <laughs> okay. Bill, is your hand up? Yes. Gardner? Your hand, Bill, I don't see your hand up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Minutes approved. Uh, so our first speaker, I hope you don't mind waiting a few minutes, uh, uh, Vince, you'll, you'll learn about affordable housing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but Tucker is a master of many skills in this town and does a really great job. And um, among the subjects all of you have uh, asked us about in the past years, and Tucker spoke to our board last year as well, is what's going on with affordable housing? How come the town decided to spend $20 million without knowing where the money's going to be spent? And by the way, what's going on with that litigation at six fairgrounds? So uh, what I'm thinking is we should, we should talk about having um, about a presentation from you folks, talk about 15 or 20 minutes, and then, a, a, and then provide for another 10 or 15 minutes of questions, and then we can go on to Vincent and the next subject. Okay, so go, you're on, Tucker. Bill, if you want, you can press play movie and you can, we can see your picture as well. Thanks, Tucker, go on. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, members of the committee for the opportunity to be with you all again. Um, I will spare you from uh, 15 or 20 minutes of nonstop talking. I might just give a quick uh, overview, touching on some of the subjects that uh, Gary mentioned, as well as some others in terms of what's been happening with housing and then really open it up to questions because I, I think that may be the most useful to you all. Um, so uh, let's start with Six Fairgrounds, which has been a project that you all have heard about for a few years. That's a 64 unit rental apartment project at uh, Fairgrounds Road, a town sponsored project that was awarded several years ago and has been tied up in litigation, as Gary mentioned. So the good news there is that the um, end of the legal road uh, has come for the appellants. Um, this spring, uh, after receiving a uh, defeat from um, the Superior Court, um, excuse me, the Court of Appeals, uh, the appellants had gone to the Supreme Judicial Court to see if that body might take up their case and the Supreme Judicial Court uh, determined that they would not. So that is um, the end of the, the legal line as we understand it. And now the project is clear to proceed with its plans to seek a tax credit award, which has always been part of the financing aspect of this project. Uh, we believe there will be a mini round of tax credits this fall and the we know the developer is planning to apply to that round if there is a mini round and um we believe uh, i should say the developer believes that while there certainly is no guarantee 
that this project um, would stand to score well um, with respect to the awards in this mini round. So it's a little bit to be determined, but what I can tell you is that if it does receive a tax credit award and the awards would be made in the December, January timeframe, the act of that award would translate into two new years of safe harbor from the 40B uh, uh, process, if you will. Okay. Um, so right now, uh, I'll mention, again, the, the board may already be well familiar that we are presently in a two year period of safe harbor, which carries us until June 13th of 2021. So if six fairgrounds did receive an award, we actually would end up cannibalizing a little bit of our current period. It's just the way that it would work. There's no opportunity to change the timing of when we would get the credit for six fairgrounds. Therefore, um, we would simply have a new two year period, but that, that would be a good thing. Um, so in addition to that project, there are several other things that have been happening. Gary brought up the Neighborhood First program. Um, we're pleased to be able to share here, you may have already read in the paper that uh, the Affordable Housing Trust reach, recently acquired two parcels along Orange Street 135 and 137 Orange Street, right across the street more or less from Marine Home Center, backing up to uh, Bayberry Commons, um, where under local zoning up to 32 units could be created uh, at that location. Uh, the trust uh, and many others uh, feel that that is just um, about as uh, desirable a situation as we can have with respect to walkable living, reliance on um, the NRTA, which is right across the street. Uh, I mean, it's literally down the block from the main supermarket, pharmacies, banks, post office, you name it, um, in addition to a, a number of restaurants. Um, and other goods and services. So it, it, we, we really are quite excited about that location. One of the beauties of it uh, is that um, while the zoning allows up to 32 units, um, it, we may or may not end up you know, going with the maximum number. Um, we certainly need additional housing, but just in terms of um, Referencing, referencing safe harbor, 24 is the magic number to get one year of safe harbor on Nantucket. Um, so uh, in concert, we are actually on the verge of issuing an RFP. Uh, the trust met earlier this week to endorse one um, to go out in search of more scattered site, if you will, locations. We, we think that the Orange Street location um, meets that criteria uh, in terms of it's in a markedly different location than other, uh, call it affordable or year-round developments um, exist or are planned for. Uh, but we also think that that could be augmented with um, some further scattered site locations where maybe there are multiple units in smaller numbers, but multiple units possible, and that that might, you know, layer in some additional additional needed housing uh, in a, um, uh, I guess I, I might say like a spirit consistent with the, uh, the original uh, article. So, um, one of the things also about the Orange Street site is that it, it potentially does allow us to also pursue uh, at a future date a, a tax credit award. And that, um, that is substantial in terms of what impact it would have on needing to provide additional local subsidy beyond the actual acquisition of the initial land. 
Um, so meanwhile, um, I'm sure as people have driven Old South Road, uh, you can see that the Richmond uh, apartments have been um, going up. Um, they uh, have already completed, I believe, uh, approximately 48 of the 98 units um, that are part of their first phase of this. Um, so they are uh, chugging along and uh, those all count on the SHI list and are in fact the principal contributors to our being in the present two year period of safe harbor. Um, uh, I, there are other aspects I can talk about. I may just briefly mention that as the board may recall, there's been um, uh, some solid effort and this board has been very supportive of it, which we are very appreciative of uh, to get a uh, transfer fee, a real estate transfer fee passed at the state house in order to um, have a reliable source of ongoing revenue to address the issue here. The 25 million that was passed last year, the 20 million being part of Neighborhood First and 5 million being bonded by the CPC certainly <clears throat> makes a big difference, but it won't necessarily uh, solve everything. And so there actually has been a concerted effort at the state house by multiple municipalities at this point originally we were we were the first um and i think other municipalities sort of thought you know that's an interesting idea let's see if nantucket can get through um you know we ran into a lot of opposition from the off-island real estate association and finally other communities said well you know if the legislature is not going to you know, let Nantucket go through and us to follow, let's just all, you know, kind of do it at the same time. So now Boston, as an example, has adopted a measure very similar to ours. And there presently is um, uh, a coordinated effort into trying to move um, either the multiple Sorry, say that again. Uh, home rule petitions from the half dozen municipalities forward as a block or in fact to have some statewide enabling legislation uh, for any municipality in the Commonwealth to opt into that would uh, yes, largely mirror what our original intention was. So um, with that, I, I, I may, may open it up to questions. So members of the committee, uh, some of you might have questions. Anyone? Go ahead, Bill. Make sure you're off mute. I just did. Thank you, Tucker. Most interesting. Uh, I have two questions. The first is relates to the uh, possible locations. And I certainly agree with you that the Orange Street location sounds ideal in so many respects. I've never understood why this effort to provide affordable housing involves more than just projects like Orange Street. Uh, there's a lot of talk about individual units here and there throughout the island, you know, buying an old house and fixing it up. And I don't understand why anybody would pour resources into that when you get more bang for your buck with an Orange Street type development. And my second question is, could you tell us what specifically are the criteria for uh, a resident to apply for affordable housing unit and how the information they provide is verified? Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, so uh, to answer your first question, when the $20 million article was passed last spring, the Affordable Housing Trust immediately uh, set up an advisory committee, which we call the Neighborhood First Advisory Committee, um, a nine member uh, group with some great expertise, uh, housing expertise uh, represented on there. Um, Doug Abbey, who is a seasonal resident here, um, is one of the co-chairs along with uh, Peter Hoey, uh, a year round resident. And um, they, we had quite a bit of interest, uh, a number of applications for the, uh, to serve on this. And that group um, really set about setting up 
several strategies uh, to how to best um, utilize these funds. And so um, in the end, there were three strategies which were identified. One is very much in the vein of the Orange Street strategy. A second uh, is what we refer to as buy down. So the opportunity to perhaps buy down the affordability in an existing unit. And then the third is this um, single or more one-off scattered site location. And I would um, say that, you know, the group largely agrees with the sentiment that you expressed, Bill, that, um, you know, the original idea of let's go buy single homes scattered all around the island, all of different vintages, all with unique um, issues and requirements, um, you know, was not the most efficient use of taxpayer uh, dollars and, you know, really wouldn't allow the opportunity to tap, uh, well, let's say to leverage what we're contributing locally with some of these other programs, like I mentioned, uh, the tax credit program. So um, in their evaluation criteria, uh, they determined that the emphasis of these dollars should absolutely be uh, in the area of the Orange Street type of opportunity um, and, you know, kind of uh, put a, um, uh, a gauge around, you know, you know, maybe 70 80% of the dollars should be expended um, toward that type of effort. Um, you know, then they did have a range of, um, you know, maybe maybe there are some opportunities that are these single situations. When the program was passed at town meeting and then at the ballot, you know, as you can imagine, we did hear from a number of property owners who said, you know, hey, I have something that I think um, might be of interest. And so we said, that's terrific to know about. Um, we are going to be an issuing an RFP at some point, And, you know, we would encourage you to respond. But as an example, um, you know, there are situations out there that are like, you know, five units on a property in town, uh, again, walkable living and you know, depending on obviously what the economics would end up looking like in terms of what the owner was seeking and also what might need to go in to improve them, um, they, we might be able to do some things that aren't necessarily uh, quite as um, uh, economically effective as, as uh, call it an Orange Street type, type project, but um, they may not be far off. So the, there is some merit for sure to the looking at what's out there and whether there are some individual situations that really could, um, you know, add to what we need and make sense. Um, so then the second question I think was really around um, what, uh, how does one qualify for an affordable home? I'm sorry, Bill, maybe you could clarify for me. That's exactly, what are the criteria for qualification for an affordable home? Sure, so, um, so for example, uh, I'll, I'll use Richmond's project. Um, they have in their rental project, there are 25% um, of the units are restricted to folks earning 80% of area median income or less, households earning 80% of area median income or less. And then actually the remainder, the 75% are at market. So in order to qualify for the 80%, um, they actually held a series of uh, informational meetings with um, their agent. And so there are folks who are certified to uh, review the um, uh, qualifications of applicants. And so in Richmond's case, they work with SEB associates they held, they published um, uh, all of the criteria, all of the requirements, um, held several information sessions, and um, uh, from there, you know, were available to folks as they were filling out their application, and um, 
then reviewing the applications uh, according to um, really the state guidelines. Um, so uh, what does it mean to be an 80% household on Nantucket? So in Nantucket, the 100% of area median income is approximately 116,000 a year. So that's a, a household of four folks where the total household income would be at 116 or less. Um, it's not a straight line calculation to get to 80 and it does depend on the, the household size. So there would be different requirements for a one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartment, for example, at Richmond. But um, you know, in general, if you were to take uh, you know, approximately 80% of 116, that is, that is the threshold um, uh, for a, per, a four person family or household on Nantucket. Does that answer your question, Bill? It does very well, thank you, Greg. Any, any other questions for Tucker, members of the committee? Not at this time. Okay, so, uh, well, Tucker, I thank you very much. If you want to wait around after, we, we want to have talk about Vince's uh, program. And uh, if you'd like to stay around, you can, or if you have other places to go, that would be okay too. We really appreciate your coming. Uh, at one of our meetings, either later today, if you're around, or the next meeting, maybe we can talk about Town Government Study Committee, because we're interested in that as well. So thank you once again, your, your choice as to whether you will stay on. In the meantime, let me uh, talk to you folks about uh, the, the important work that Vince Murphy is doing. Vince is the newly appointed last year uh, Coastal Residency Coordinator for the Town of Nantucket. And, and basically what you all are con concerned about, and not just us non-voting taxpayers, but everyone who's on the island, is what's happening to our island with rising tides, storm surges, Last year, especially, we saw last summer was much, much more uh, serious than this summer's uh, storm tide, from what I can see, at least. Uh, and so let me uh, just briefly tell you why I thought it's important for us to have this on the agenda. Uh, as some of you may recall, um, the Coastal Resiliency Plan calls for the setup of a Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee the town has decided, they appointed Vince, he's now the coordinator for the town, and we're in the process of coming up with a plan. And the town has asked uh, for a committee of concerned citizens, and they happen to have, we happen to have a really talented group of people. I leave myself off that because I happen to be the representative of the committee on, for the non-voting taxpayers. But we have people from the planning board, people from the conservation commission, uh, and PhD uh, folks on the island who are well versed on all of this. And our, what we are charged with doing is working with Vince when the plan is being developed to put in comments to make sure that all of the considerations of the people on the island ought to be taking, taken care of, at least con considered. Uh, as part of this process, we're in the process now, and Vince can talk about uh, all of these strategies that we're thinking about, but we need a plan. And um, Vince is, has finished with an RFP. You, you all know about the RFP process. It's a tortuous process. That process has gone to the next step. An RFP has been issued, and it is outstanding now, and there are several applicants Vince can talk about who are currently thinking about making a proposal to provide the residency plan for the island of Nantucket. Um, in the meantime, our committee is concerned that we see earth, earth, earth movers moving earth, construction going up all over, and no one seems to be focusing as much as we think they should. So we came up with this great idea to come up with a, a plan to have the select board, to have the select board uh, put in place a policy that requires or that encourages every one of the regulatory bodies in our town to consider rising tides and storm surges in their normal approval process. And so we, it took us a while to do that. It took several meetings for us to do that. And we came up with this resolution 
uh, which we propose to the select board. And finally, a week and a half ago, it went to the select board and basically what it does, and uh, there is a copy uh, in the meeting materials, so you can see what was presented to the select board. And at the select board meeting, unfortunately, um, the select board had asked, someone had asked the uh, town engineer to take a look at that. And the town engineer, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, fly specced it far, far greater than it needed to be done because it's really a, a concept and a policy piece. And the result of his fly specking was a four page memo and the select board wasn't quite sure what to do. And so they did nothing. And so what we were hoping to do is put into place this policy and this policy would be in effect from now until the final plan is finally produced. Since the RFP is out now, the, the Vince uh, can tell you that we're hoping to pick someone to do, put the plan together by the end of the summer, maybe early fall, and then maybe get the plan done by the end of next year. And what do we do in the interim? So that's what we wanted the, the select board to do, to put in place this temporary, this temporary policy and um, I think I'll stop talking there because I'll let Vince continue talking about that and take some questions. Uh, and if, if in fact some of you feel the same way I feel, uh, we have a resolution, I've been talking to Peter Hale about this. We have a proposed resolution that we'd like to offer you that we would send to the select board saying we really encourage you to put something in place temporarily for the interim period between now and when the final policy is finally adopted by the town. So Vince, I'll stop talking. Your show. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just to say to on, on Gary's behalf, because he's uh, he didn't say it for himself, uh, for uh, Gary's input on crack, he has, well, for me personally, been an invaluable resource. He has given um, a different perspective on a lot of things. He has come to me to, to express some legal concerns from time to time. He has given me in-depth, uh, first-hand experience of living in a, a, a low-lying flood zone. Um, and I have to say thank you, Gary. So before I get to talking about the recommendation, um, I'm afraid I don't know anyone on the screen except Gary. Um, I've, I've never met Tucker. We've exchanged one email, I think, but that's about it. Either way, I just want to very briefly introduce myself and give a very small bit of background before I get to it. So Vince Murphy worked for the Natural Resources Department. Um, by the accent, you might be able to tell that I'm Irish. Um, this time last year, roughly speaking, it was uh, September uh, 14th last year, I got my American citizenship. So that very was a bit good. of fun. So my background is I was... Um, a qualified chef after school. Uh, most Irish parents uh, asked that their kids have a trade. I decided to continue with education after that. Uh, uh, a degree in wildlife management and conservation biology uh, from the University of Portsmouth in England Hello. in 2005. Then in 2009, I got a master's degree uh, in ecosystem conservation and landscape management. Uh, in 2012, I started a PhD I have on uh, deer and commercial forestry in Ireland. I have one paper left to publish. Once that's published, it'll be a book of published uh, research, and that's a thesis, um, which will have five papers in it at that point, and I will be able to call myself doctor finally. So pretty soon, there'll be another uh, doctor on crack, well, involved with the work of crack. For seven years, I worked as an environmental consultant in Ireland. And when I came uh, to America, uh, I worked an awful lot with birds. That was my first job with the town. I was the protected species technician. But my experience as a consultant meant, that, uh, and my master's degree meant that I was qualified for the position that came up uh, within the town uh, for the Coast Resilience Coordinator. I started that on the 29th of July last year, a few more days, and I'll be in the job a year. So in September, we started the research phase and uh, between me and the committee, we collected up a, a hell of a lot of information, reviewed an awful lot of coast resilience plans from other communities, saw what went into them. Then we started uh, in December and January, I started putting together an RFP. In that process, uh, in committee meetings, we quickly realized there was a gap. We needed something to 
fill a gap for about a year or so, a couple of years until an RFP would come along. That's when the conversation about the uh, recommendation started. So we worked on that through January and February. We were still working on it in March and we were coming to the end of the process at the time. We obviously hit the better part of a three, four month delay because of COVID-19. In June, we took it up again. Uh, June 16th, we finished, uh, crack finished the recommendation. I sent it to put it on a select board agenda. It was at that point that um, town admin asked to see if there was any issues with this. One of the people that also is, uh, works for Crack uh, from town staff um, is Chuck Larson. He had been involved in sections of the RFP over time, but he's also a qualified engineer. He's the town special projects manager, but he was asked to look at the RFP as, the as an engineer, look for where the holes in it might be, see where the exposure to the town might be. So as Gary said, he, had a look at it. He looked at it for how it might be applied. Um, Chuck is a very nice guy. He is incredibly thorough and maybe got a little bit, I don't want to say carried away. That's the wrong way of putting it. I don't want to mischaracterize what Chuck did, but he found some holes in it. When it was presented to the board, to the select board, um, by myself and Mary Longacre, the chair of Crack, she did the majority of the presenting. I was just there to answer some questions. An awful lot of things became clearer to Chuck. He understood that the recommendation uh, was okay. And he only then turned out to have some issues with the supporting information. So I'm not going to share my screen. I'm just, it's in your pack. I'm just going to read the recommendation as it currently stands. And then I'm going to go through one or two of the changes that uh, are going to be discussed at the crack meeting on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., which is an open public meeting that everyone is free to come to if they wish, and I encourage everyone. So the recommendation as currently written says, the CRAC recommends all town departments, boards, commissions and committees, and any service providers, contracted engineers and consultants need to be aware and need to use the NOAA high uh, projections to accommodate moderate storm surge as well as sea level rise in their decisions, deliberations, and planning, and planning process. The, the, these data are periodically updated by, the, by NOAA and will be posted on the crack page of the town website. So one of Ch uh, Chuck's main issues, I use the word projections. That's what everyone sees them as, but he prefers to use the word scenarios. There are six scenarios. Together, it's a group of projections. I would have thought they were synonyms for each other, but they apparently mean very different things. Other than that, he had some issues with the supporting information. Um, one of the documents we had been using was initially meant to be uh, a coast resilience plan. It was um, underfunded and underdesigned in some ways. It was a much smaller project. So that ended up going and getting changed. It was a, a report done by Malona McBroom that was submitted to the town in January 2020 and Crack has been using it since then. It, um, it ended up just looking at a lot of methods, a lot of uh, how you might do coast resilience, not anything that we actually need, which is a lot of engineered plans. Where's the, pl where's the problem? Where do we need to start looking at um, protecting uh, neighborhoods? How do we need to do that? that's what we were missing and that's what the next coastal resilience plan will do uh, in its entirety so it'll also perform a greater um, so the one of the things that the malona mcbroom report did was also look uh, do a, co uh, a vulnerability assessment and risk analysis it did that but it didn't do it on a fine enough scale that uh, they were also not asked to do it on a fine enough scale so this uh, so we ended up with a somewhat usable report but it was outside of the scope of what had been intended in the first place Long story short, that's why we're on to stage two of drafting a full coastal resilience plan. And that's the, the, where we are now. Uh, we advertised, the town advertised, sorry, not advertised, it posted the RFP on uh, May 22nd, I think it was. The uh, process closed on June 30th. And since July 1st, we have been reviewing those. So we're 25 odd days into reviewing those documents. About another two weeks, that the group 
the panel that's working on that are going to meet, uh, rank those RFPs, and then return that to finance departments so that they can complete their work. So then hopefully speaking, September, uh, end of August, beginning of September, we'll be able to approach one of the seven consultants, hopefully, um, or sorry, finance will, the procurement will, and make an offer. But then that'll start a process about a year long. And in that interim period, we need uh, something to do, uh, something to cover any development in that length of time, um, which is the recommendation. So at that point, uh, I know there's a, an interesting history to all of that. Um, are there any questions on the recommendation or the RFP? Peter. Muted. Can I ask a question? Uh, Peter is muted. Yeah, Peter, don't be muted. You're on mute, I think. I just did it. Yeah, yeah. My, my little button was not showing at that point. Um, the, my question is, I think for myself and, and maybe for others, to understand what a coastal resiliency plan is. It's a, it's a, a little bit of an amorphous concept. Is, mm -hmm. is that a plan to uh, deal with building codes to make building along the coast where it's threatened by storm surge or high tide, uh, uh, a diff change the code to put things higher, or is it a plan to retreat from those areas um, uh, and not allow building in them? Uh, can, can you, and I understand the plan is not there, so there's no definitive answer, but just to give us a little bit of an idea of uh, what, what, the plan might cover. Sure thing. So yes, it is amorphous and it's quite large, but because we have a very, very solid RFP uh, that was put out, we know everything we want to be in the plan. So pretty much it includes all of the above that you said. I must just quickly say, we keep talking about sea level rise, so people tend to think of flooding, but the plan will deal with more than just flooding. It'll also deal with erosion. So that if you think about flooding and erosion zones, it's probably an easier way to deal with it. So that if you go down the road and say, right, we know where it's flooding, we know where it's eroding. How do you deal with that? And it is going to be changing policies. It's going to be changing design codes, but it's also going to be physical infrastructure as well. So take, I keep talking about flooding in terms of Washington Street and Easy Street because it's places people know quite well, but this could easily be applied to Madica too, or other parts like Palpus Harbor. But for the sake of argument, for uh, Washington Street, uh, there's some things that you could do there, some physical infrastructure, you could potentially raise the height of the road slightly, then that would have a, a minor levy effect and anything on the inside of the road could be protected. You could create a, a wetland system in front of it that would hold water and stop waves coming in. It would be a form of wave attenuation. Um, in erosion zones, you can talk about you know, the potential for retreat. How do you do that? How do you do that safely? And do people then just lose their land? This is one of the things that's going to come out of it. Then in terms of the policy side of things, um, uh, currently what the town uses and has to use is the FEMA flood uh, zone standards. So if you're say in uh, FEMA AE zone eight, you have to be eight feet of elevation effectively. But what one of the things that we're looking at uh, for the Coast Resilience Plan to bring a recommendation forward on is DFE, design flood elevations. So you know that we're going to have some storm surge, but what will that storm surge look like in the year 2050, 30 years from now, when sea levels might be, say, for the sake of argument, about a foot higher. So that's a foot higher at high tide and at low tide. It's a relative change so that the sea will always just be that much higher. So we know then at a storm surge uh, in 2050, plus another foot of sea level rise, uh, we're going to need more protection. That's the easiest way I can describe how, to, uh, how DFE might be applied. Um, so that will, might require a change to building codes in flood zones. Um, or in addition to the, to the FEMA standards is one, another way of looking at it. So it, it, there's going to be a policy side, there's going to be an engineering side, um, and then there's also going to have to be how do, you, how do we use land? Um, we've got some of the best oceanfront property anywhere. Um, we've got beautiful places like Hulbert Avenue that are low lying, but we want to retain those communities. How do you do that? That is one of the other big things. So 
it's going to require some serious thought. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 that, in addition to, in, during this interim period, that in addition to just having the professionals take these things into account, that the owners of the projects should get this information in, in case they're clueless as to the fact that they're in a storm surge uh, area, uh, that they should have this information so they themselves can encourage, you know, the, the designers and builders to go beyond whatever the current code is uh, to protect themselves. And Vince can tell you that under his guidance, we have a subcommittee of the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee. It's called our Education Subcommittee. I'm not on it, but some people are. not And part of their job is to start educating the people on the island hey, this, this stuff is going on, it's going to affect you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, just, just to give them their due credit, it's um, interestingly, the three uh, members of CRAC that were the at-large members, uh, Mary Longacre, uh, Graham Durovich, and it's chaired by uh, Sarah Trainer boyce Sarah Boyce from Linda Loring. Who's yeah. a PhD, yeah. Yeah, and my, my understanding of the FEMA standards are that they're woefully sort of out of date and out of touch with the subject of the sea level rise and, and the coast um, you know throughout throughout the country and uh, it creates all kinds of insurance and other problems so this this to me is kind of like you know dealing with science and um, uh, taking steps that are knowledgeable instead of relying on old information correct and this is one of the things that um, the recommendation is hopefully going to cover as well. So uh, one of the things in the recommendation is to use the NOAA height scenario. I'm changing to the word scenario now because that's something that will hopefully come out of the discussion on Tuesday morning. Um, the height scenario accounts for 9.25 feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. Most scenario, the, the, the intermediate and intermediate high which are kind of the middle of the road and somewhat more likely, but we can't ever say for certain, are uh, four feet, or just a little over four feet, 4.33 feet and uh, six and a bit feet. I can't remember the exact number. It's not in my head. But say for the sake of argument, four to six feet. But then if you take the high projection, which is probably just a little outside, but something that we should use for at least a year, until we have a much better uh, design flood elevation uh, that's actually applicable to different parts of the island. If you take that 9.25 feet, so yeah. that's going to be a little bit above uh, the flood elevation and a little bit of redundancy above that as well. So that, so say a building is built now um, in the harbour area, for the sake of argument, it'll have to use say VE eight or nine, and then it'll have to have a little redundancy above that again. Uh, in order to account for sea level rise uh, over the useful life of that building, say 50 to 80 years. Um, so that would be anything that's constructed within the next year. Um, and that redundancy, I would hope, would also potentially include storm, storm tide stacking, which we see too frequently here during nor'easters when the tide doesn't get let out of the harbour. Thank you. So what my suggestion was, um, was to, for us, we think something really needs to be done just for the interim period. We want the select board to know that it's really important and they shouldn't dilly dally about this. So that's why, uh, and, and Kathy, are you there? Kathy, could you screen share that resolution? The, the, the resolution that I was, I sent you this morning or yesterday, whenever I Before sent you. Before you get to the resolution. Yes. Can uh, I get a couple of questions answered? Sure. Um, first question, you mentioned the township engineer issued a four page report. Um, can you give us a synopsis as to what he said? So yeah, he was hoping that the recommendation will be closer to a, design, a, a DFE, design flood ele a elevation. Um, in reality, it wasn't. Uh, it was just a broad recommendation. Um, so Chuck wanted some, something far more detailed that would be closer to engineering specifications, uh, which this wasn't. This is just a recommendation to, be, to get uh, town boards and committees, et cetera, to be aware of what they should do, not um, exact, say, foot-by-foot -foot topographical 
uh, elevations for what each person should do in each flood zone type. It, it, that's never what it was intended for. Uh, one of the things that um, Chuck has recommended that did come from his uh, four page thing is something that uh, we negated to do. Uh, we never tied it to a specific height and time. So the way that the NOAA flood projections work and we just kind of took it, uh, I took it as granted as read that they just um, are pinned to the sea level as it was in Nantucket Harbour in the year 2000. But we never wrote that down. Now it's included. So aside from changing a handful of small word choice changes, like from uh, projections to scenarios, he did bring in more useful information. Um, and now should uh, Crack choose to take some or most of his recommendations, it seems like Chuck will be broadly supportive. And from the meeting at, um, on the, uh, with the select board on that Wednesday, what was it the 21st? No, it wasn't, I can't remember the date, beg your pardon. Um, it seems like select board members were broadly supportive. They just wanted to clarify there weren't any issues. The uh, select board, uh, have they shown any indication that uh, if a formal report is uh, done by a uh, outside consultant, uh, including the recommendations into the state, into the town master plan? I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, basically, if you have a report that's done from an outside agency uh, and that report comes to the town and there are certain changes that uh, are going to be suggested, will the uh, select board consider amending their master plan to uh, incorporate those changes? So what we're, the process that we're in is trying to get the Coast Resilience Plan in place by next year, uh, say roughly about this time next year, for the, uh, uh, it will be my hope. And then that will have recommendations for design flood elevations. Um, the mechanism for getting that into the town master plan, not something I know about. Well, I would think that it would make sense if you would spend the money for a report that uh, yes. it be included in the town master plan. Yes, Lou, I think that we can be comfortable about that. First of all, one of the members of the select board is on our committee. Matt Fee is a member of the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee. So he's there with us, and he's also positively concerned about the fact that the island has to start taking this into consideration and take some action. The town is going to spend I think we're thinking that the we haven't got the bids yet, and that's a while before they come in, but it's going to be over a half a million dollars. So when we spend five or six hundred thousand dollars for a study, they're only going to do that believing that it's important enough for them to receive the study, adopt it, and start taking action. I, uh, I appreciate that comment, and it's good to know that there is someone from uh, the select board on the committee. Uh, I hope that the township would recognize if they're going to spend that kind of money that the recommendations that come from that study be incorporated into the master plan. Thank you. Just to support that, once recommendations do come along, it's, it's effectively my job as the coordinator uh, uh, to, to make the noise to make sure that does happen. Good, good. Thank you. If you take a look at the resolution uh, that Kathy put up there, I purposely worded it carefully. I, had, I, didn't, I haven't run that by Vince yet, but I wanted to make it really painless. So I said, endorses the substance of the proposal that the, committee, that the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee brought before the select board, urges the select board to promptly put in place a policy that will facilitate consideration, can see the language I put in there, non-threatening, making sure that hopefully that the town will put into place something now so that we don't have to wait a year and a half before people have to start thinking about that when they go to planning boards, zoning boards, conservation commission, etc. And I can, uh, and if, you, if you don't mind, I'll read you a paragraph. I've just been doodling and I, and I had Peter help me, uh, Peter Hale help me as well. If in fact we, you folks approve of this and we pass this resolution, there would be a letter sent by our committee to the town with this resolution. And the first paragraph I wrote in draft, once again, this is not final writing, but I wrote at the July 25 meeting of the ACNVT, the committee was updated on the work of the crack, including reference to the proposal. 
that was recently presented by it to the select board at its meeting of July 15. No action was taken by the select board on the proposal at that meeting, but was tabled for further review. The intent of the proposal by CRAC was to seek to assure that various Nantucket regulatory boards and committees take into consideration rising sea levels and tidal changes in their decision-making process currently, since the final coastal resiliency plan is unlikely to be completed and adopted until late 2021, or perhaps even spring 2022. With all of the construction and developmental activity underway on the island at this time, and likely to accelerate once the limitations of the pandemic are behind us, the ACNVT, that's us, believes there should be no further delay in putting into place an interim policy in substance similar to that which CRAC has proposed. And then there would be the resolution. And then Peter Hale suggested that the following would go after that in this letter to the town. It would say, the ACNVT understands the current building codes do not take into account the latest NOAA storm surge scenarios and that the town's regulatory bodies do not have legal authority to enforce rules or regulations in excess of the codes. However, the public relies on the town to have codes and regulations that are designed to protect public health and safety. Until such time as the codes are amended to take into account new information regarding storm surge, the very least the town can do is to, sure, to, to be sure that those seeking permits in areas of the town that are deemed to be subject to storm surge are aware of the latest scenarios before they build so that they may take them into account. Once again, we haven't really words with this, but those are the thoughts, that's the thought process of the message we want to give to the town. So I'd be glad to have some comments from you folks. What do you uh, think? Gary, it's Peter. Yes. Uh, I, I, look, I, I have, um, I'm totally in agreement that this has to be has to be uh, um, dealt with by the town. I guess what I'm having a problem with is a little bit of a cart and horse, and maybe because I'm not that familiar with uh, with um, crack and what it. But I mean, until you know, it's it just strikes me that until you know details that crack is investigating, and and um, it's hard to put into place uh, the requirements uh, that um, of uh, the building code, et cetera. Uh, and to just sort of say, well, if it's simply to say you need to be aware of this, clearly that's fine. But I, I guess I'm, I'm having, I'm struggling to understand what it is we're asking the town selectmen to do, affirmatively do, uh, to deal with this bec before the crack uh, um, report is taken care of. Those are exactly the words that were in Vince's resolution to the town. It said that these boards, commissions, and committees, and any service providers and consultants need to be aware of and need to use these high projections to accommodate moderate storm surge as well as sea level. So that's really all we're doing. Once again, we're not changing building codes. We can't. And if people right. want to object, they'll hire a lawyer, and the lawyer will say, I understand what you're saying with your scenario, but it's not in the building code, and I'm going to sue you and take you to court if you try to stop me but at least we know we're making them aware and we want them to take it into consideration. And it's probably for their own good in most instances, because why would people spend a lot of money putting up a structure that is gonna be flooded in 10 years and it would be unusable in 12 years, you know? So mm -hmm. it's really- right, so it's, just a, it's, it's just it's simply making them aware. We're not taking any affirmative. Yeah. Not taking know, any we, affirmative. we can't change the building code, so we can't change the requirements. Okay. So, so Right. I mean, just, just uh, Peter, uh, to the way I think about this, it's, it's almost like a voluntary compliance with, uh, with, with uh, proper building um, uh, measures in lieu of actual regulations. Uh, and uh, to basically call people's attention to the fact that you know, you're building a three foot high dam where you really need a six foot high dam in case you didn't know it. Um, but there's so no enforcement, but there's no, but there's understandingly no enforcement right. measure with it. No, we have no ability to change any of that. And we're not asking the select board to do that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just the way that I view it, um, you've characterized it quite well. 
I like to look at this as a lead in policy and in about a year or so we'll have a real policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, an enforceable real policy. Right. Okay. So Peter, would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I move that uh, the ACNVT uh, approve uh, of the resolution, uh, vote in favor of the resolution and authorize uh, the uh, chairman uh, to uh, send a letter uh, as, as stated with, of course, the normal prerogatives of editorial uh, review uh, so as to make it sure that it uh, reads well and uh, does not reflect poorly on any of our writing ability. <laughs> Second? Second. Second. Okay, we'll have a, a vote now. Any? Uh, so let me ask for a vote. Uh, uh, Peter Hale? I, I vote yes. Kathy? Are you there, Kathy? She might have stepped away. Bill Gardner? Yes. Lou Bassano? Yes. Don Green? Yes. And myself? Yes. And Kathy is probably... Yes. Yes. I need a vote. Do I get to vote? Yes. Who, who, who yes. did I ask? Peter Kahn. Oh, yes, Peter. Absolutely. Yes. Vote. Bill Sherman votes yes. Bill Sherman? And the chairman votes yes, so it's uh, com unanimous. So I will, I will talk to Vince to make sure that we didn't screw up that language too much in the resolution, but it'll basically be this. That's really, it's the substance that we want them to think about and the urgency. Thank you, Kathy. You can take that off the screen now. Okay. I, I just had something I'd like to add. Um, the insurance that's given to people on the island, property insurance, usually has to come from the state because private insurers will not insure. What data do they use in determining uh, their, their premiums? Go ahead, Vince. So uh, they use a variety of data. Um, they use a combination of uh, FEMA flood data, but they can also look at any past claims on the property as well, say before a person purchased it to see if there was any flooding and where it came from. It's, it's, um, it's complex to say the least, but uh, I don't know that this recommendation will affect that just yet. The recommendation, sorry, the correct policy that'll come out from DFE this time next year, hopefully speaking, that'll be a different matter. And someone uh, said the FEMA uh, maps uh, are delayed. I know one came out just a few years ago, but how often do they update their, their maps? I don't mean to give you a no answer, but how long is a piece of string? Sometimes they update them every, two year, uh, every three or four years. It sometimes it could be as long as eight or 10 years. Um, we haven't seen new maps, I think, in six or seven years. Um, and we're, we're, we're due for new ones. And I've also been working uh, to try and uh, review uh, a different map set of maps for FEMA for a different thing, for erosion. And that was supposed to get launched uh, before Christmas in December. But they have a whole launch process and they need a public launch, which is part of their rules they can't get away from, which is one of the things that delays these when you can't have a public launch. I think that... Um... I'm not speaking out of turn, but the, this whole FEMA map issue is yet another political issue rather than a scientific issue. And it is, as I understand it, um, these maps uh, affect what can be insured, can't be insured privately, uh, and um, uh, whole sorts of things. And they form the basis of uh, a huge cross subsidy of uh, you know taxpayers paying for flood insurance claims uh, that uh, wouldn't occur if there were accurate maps and people were building uh, according to real information rather than delayed information. Uh, and I think right now the National Flood Insurance Program is something like $30 billion in the hole or more. I don't know about the state insurance programs, but this is this is all just kind of a game. Right now. Yeah. So this is a good point. There's always errors in the FEMA flood maps. Um, say, for the sake of argument, I know that in down near Codfish Park, um, I think it's Atlantic Avenue down in Sconset, there's a few houses there that were in a flood zone that aren't. Same thing happened at a few buildings in Madiket. They were, they were put into a flood zone when they weren't. There's always error. 
and they're always correcting these. They're also looking at um, change over time as well. Some places might have had, I don't know, a different engineering structure or it gets a new engineering structure and suddenly won't flood as much anymore. Those are the changes they constantly need to bring up. Um, there is another source of flood information that's only come out recently and I'm still looking into it, but it seems like it's a kind of a pay as you go system of sorts. Uh, an organization, a, a nonprofit in New York called First Street Foundation, they've brought out some new flood maps so that like if you can take the look for your property, I think you might have to pay them whatever fee, um, take that information to FEMA and say, look, my house isn't in the flood zone you think it's in, and then your rates could change. So there's other ways around this, but it, it takes a long time to change FEMA maps. You know, in my view, uh, rising tides, storm surge and flooding is going to start impacting people when two different outside entities start, uh, start taking a toll. One is the insurance industry and the other is the banks. The banks aren't going to lend money when they see properties are in flood zones and insurance companies are going to stop insuring when they start looking at these projections as they get closer and closer to likelihood. And so then people will feel that. And what, that's why our education committee in theory is trying to let people know, you know, you're buying property that is in a flood zone already. And if you take a look at the, at the scenarios, I'm not allowed to use projections either. The engineer won't like that, right? If you look at the scenarios, you know, I hope you're not, not going to amortize that over 25 years because after 10 years, you won't be using that facility. <laughs> so that's when it's going to start to bite. Very much so. Anyway, I thank you very much, Vince. Uh, anybody have any further questions? If not, we still have Tucker there, and maybe we should steal a little more of Tucker's time. And Vince, you're welcome to listen to it if you'd like, to talk about the Town Government Study Committee, because... I might just drop off. Okay, thank you very thank kindly. You so much. And I'll speak to you on Tuesday at the meeting, and any of you folks want to join that meeting by, you know, it's a virtual uh, meeting now of the... Coastal Resilience Committee, feel free, Vince has invited you all to do so. Uh, Gary, I think you have a link for it in the pack I sent you on Wednesday, okay. so feel free to forward. Okay. Thank you very, Thank very you. much, everyone. Bye now. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, Tucker, so uh, when we talked uh, last year and in previous times with John Drescher about the form of government, we used to bemoan the fact that at certain town meetings, uh, a small vocal minority were making decisions that affected the entire island. And we're frustrated by that. Now with the pandemic, we see the ultimate result of that. And I know that the town government study committee has tried to look at different ways that Nantucket could govern itself. But what I understand having gone to some meetings that you can explain is that uh, we don't have that many options. We're not allowed to have a mayor, I think, right? I don't think we're a big enough town, but but I shouldn't even suppose I'll let you kind of educate us a little bit about what the town government study committee is thinking about making our system of, um, uh, of voting more, uh, more effective and more uh, representative than it is today. Sure. Uh, thanks, Gary. I, I can uh, try to uh, give a bit of an update, um, but it, basically one of the, th things that the town government study committee is uh, uh, charged with is every five years or so looking at our present form of uh, government and making recommendations as to whether it is really serving um, the purpose and needs of the community at that particular point in time. And so we've taken quite a bit of, uh, I guess you would call it testimony over the course of the last couple of years since the group was originally formed in trying to ascertain whether our present form is meeting the needs of the community. And um, I would say that, you know, we've, we've heard uh, from a, a number of different folks and I think it's fair to generally summarize that um, we're, there are, there are concerns about whether we have, um, whether what Nantucket is today is best served by this uh, historic uh, system. Um, to quote um, Nat Lowell, uh, who has uh, 
some wonderful colloquialisms, we don't run the town from the hub anymore. Um, and so, but we don't know, you know, whether we're hearing from um, some articulate and passionate folks on the subject, whether that those folks are representative of uh, a broader feeling across the island. So one of the things that we uh, were grateful to have the opportunity to do was on the recent town election ballot, we were able to ask a couple of non-binding questions of the community. And I will say, um, as you might expect, expect in the COVID era, uh, turnout for the election was lower than uh, normal. Uh, last year, I believe there were over 3,000 ballots cast in the annual town election. Um, this year, uh, it was significantly less than that. Um, however, uh, we it was certainly a more representative sampling than um, of the number of folks who could actually attend the town government study committee meetings, which might collectively be 50 folks over the course of a couple of years. Um, so what was interesting in asked in these two questions, and the first question basically said, are you satisfied with our present form of open meeting uh, and town, you know, select board town manager form of government, just sort of yes or no. And then the second one asked whether or not you thought it would be worthwhile for the town to further investigate and spend time and resources on whether uh, an alternate form of government would be, um, uh, have merit. So interestingly, in the case of the first question, are you satisfied? The results came back slightly in favor uh, that folks were satisfied. I don't have the exact vote totals in front of me, but approximately 750 people said, I'm not satisfied. 850 people said, I'm satisfied. In the case of the second question of whether or not further felt, folks felt further time and resources should be uh, invested in looking at what options we have available to us. Um, it was interesting, in that case, uh, it was roughly, you know, 1100 votes to 500 votes in favor of continuing to look at this. Um, so even folks who, in the first case said, I'm satisfied, said, but I want you to, to, to look into this further. Um, so that's where we're at. In terms of uh, what Gary brought up there the options available to us. Yes, in, in, the, in the Commonwealth, there are basically four forms of government that you can have. You can have an open town meeting, as we do today. You can have a, what they call a representative town meeting, where Nantucket would get effectively, um, let's say, divided up into 100 precincts intended to be representative of the different areas of the island. Each precinct would vote a representative, and that individual would attend uh, a representative annual town meeting. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but then there are two other forms of government that are available in the Commonwealth, um, where you could have a city council and town manager uh, format or a city council and mayoral format. And uh, Gary is correct that presently, we are not of sufficient population according to the 2010 census to be availed of those last two options. However, um, uh, I believe the threshold is 12,000 residents. And I don't think anyone uh, questions following the 2020 census results that we would certainly qualify to have those options available to us. Um, so the next step for the committee really is um, education, essentially. Um, we want to uh, um, look, present the pros and cons really of each of these systems. There are some folks who uh, have felt that, um, you know, our, our current system might 
not be working, um, but you know, so let's maybe jump to representative uh, form of town meeting. And each of these systems has, uh, you know, true pros and cons. And so, um, at least in my own view, and I'm not here really trying to speak for the whole committee, but I think it's very important for um, members of the community, um, and in my view, uh, year-round and seasonal alike, to understand truly what are the, the pros and cons, what would we be giving up, what would we be gaining uh, in considering moving to um, staying the same or moving to one of these other forms. So with that. Questions? I have a question. There is a, Lou, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I want to comment. Uh, um, there are only the four forms that were mentioned that uh, we're allowed to use, am I correct? Correct. Um, is there any modification to what we're doing that would be allowed? And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the issues that uh, has always been sticking uh, me in the uh, back of my head is the issue of zoning. Very complicated issue. Is there any way of taking an issue of that type, taking that issue away from the town meeting and giving the power and authority to the select board to decide zoning issues? Uh, is that within uh, the scope of what's out there? Um, so I'm not an attorney. Uh, offhand, I don't know that I can answer that mm -hmm. question at a, at a, at a, uh, minimum, I would say that would be, you know, a charter change. If it were allowed under Massachusetts law, it would be a charter change and it would definitely require a vote of town meeting to do that. Tucker, the reason why I bring that up is because there are other issues that are extremely complicated. And we just talked about the problem with flooding. That's going to be an extremely complicated issue. Yep. Are we better off to have five people thoroughly versed on that issue instead of having the town uh, open it up to the rest of the folks who hear about a two minute presentation and have to make a decision. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's an excellent question, Lou. And it's certainly, um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just quote from, um, there was a article before town meeting in 2019 that involved, um, you know, some highly complex, you know, legal land use matters and so forth. And, um, uh, that had, you know, required a, a lot of thinking. And um, I just recall someone on the, this is anecdotal, of course, but, you know, someone on the floor who spoke, this is all on the record and on a tape somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, someone very uh, involved with um, uh, the community and town government aspects and so forth, you know, said, you know, it, it's a little bit crazy to think that, you know, in 10 minutes, people are going to get up to speed on some, you know, very complex issues um, uh, and, and have enough information and opportunity to, to make good decisions. So I think the sentiment you're expressing is, is definitely um, uh, out there. Lou, Lou here. Thank uh, you. Uh, I thought ahead. I would add to Lou Bassano's question is keep looking at the county charter and the possibility of amending it so that the uh, Board of County Commissioners uh, might be the one tackling the very tough, complex problems uh, rather than town meeting. Bill, I'm, I'm just not sure. Thank you. Not being that familiar. Uh, with state law, um, what would be the right way to move on an issue like this? I'm throwing out what my thoughts are, but there are people obviously, and you may be one of them because you served uh, on uh, in this area to uh, help guide us as to what can be done. A again, you know, you got state law and, and you have four different uh, charters or four different uh, uh, modes that can be used, but uh, uh, how we can fit in what we'd like. Uh, I don't know how that can be done or if it can be amended. Yeah, uh, and I don't know sitting here whether uh, uh, town council would find uh, legality in uh, allocating that uh, uh, the complex issues to the uh, 
uh, Board of County Commissioners, but it's uh, a much more efficient uh, town uh, that is local and enti governmental entity for dealing with things than is uh, open town meeting. Yeah, I'm glad. I have, uh, another uh, remark that before one considers seriously representative town meeting with say only a hundred people making a decision, what's to assure that uh, the majority of those hundred people are like uh, Tucker uh, associated with or employees of town government and thus uh, arguably prejudiced on issues affecting employment with the town. Hey, hey. So, yeah, so, I mean, I, yes, I mean, representative town meeting has its, uh, its own issues. Um, and we've heard, you know, testimony that, um, uh, well, in one way, you could say it's like, you know, out of the fr frying pan into the fire. Um, so uh, these are not, um, you know, not simple things, but I mean, one thing is uh, fairly clear to me, you know, obviously the, the, the principle is more people, uh, you know, everyone's vote should count. More people involved is going to arrive at better decisions that, um, uh, you know, a handful of people effectively making sweeping decisions for, um, uh, the entire community um, isn't necessarily uh, uh, the ideal situation unless they are elected. But the the idea is that let's say we got people super educated and they show everyone who is a voter showed up to town meeting. We can't possibly accommodate that. We have nine thousand registered voters. So by, na by the very nature of our, uh, you know, how the town is built and organized and so forth, we can't really accommodate what we want as the ideal solution, so to speak. Yeah. So let me question. For, I, first of all, I, I, I think that uh, the emphasis here needs to be on the census and getting the numbers up <laughs> beyond uh, 12,000 yes. because it, as you lay out these four um, uh, choices, it seems to me that it would be a mistake to go from the open town meeting to a representative town meeting, which sounds to me to be even less efficient than, than the current uh, situation. Uh, to me, it, it seems to me there, there are two basic issues. One is efficiency, um, and we're seeing the problems, uh, how, how with inefficient uh, the current setup is. And the other is, you know, direct versus representational government, where people think they're losing something mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the indirection of representational government. And so uh, it seems to me that, um, and then this is a, a question really, in, in a, uh, for example, the last two options, the city council options, uh, it seems to me one would still be able to have what I think are called either citizen articles or citizen warrants. In other words, by you know, collecting enough signatures, you can get something to the, um, the town council for the town council to consider. Um, uh, I, I know I'm in a lot of er other areas, including the city of Miami, where there are town council meetings and citizens go and appear before the town council every week on every issue and get their opportunity to speak. And it's almost like a, uh, while the citizen speaking does not necessarily have a direct vote, does not have a direct vote, it's just the council members who do um, and who are elected by those citizens. They, they um, it seems to me they are able to as effectively pursue their rights in terms of advocating for things that, or against things that they think are uh, in, in their interest or in society's interest or against it. Uh, so I think the, the issue probably here is going to come down to convincing people that they're not going to lose something, but they're going to gain something. They still will have their voice, uh, um, but they will gain efficiency. 
Um, and, and hopefully uh, this can be moved in that direction. But in order to move it in that direction, you've got to have enough population to justify one of these better, what I think is better forms of government. I'll tell you what I find troubling, um, and this responds to a little bit what Lou was talking about, uh, and, and Bill, Bill Sherman, you may know the answer to this. Uh, I was very upset uh, last year when at the annual town meeting, a group of activists put in some proposals which succeeded in taking away from the select board authority to do kind of basic stuff. You know, they want to say, without, without us voting, we, the entire 9,000 population, you can't put a stop sign in on the road. Can you imagine that? And those are the proposals that we have had at our town meetings. A bunch of activists get together and they say, we, we want to take away power from the select board. Lou, you're talking about giving more power to the select board on zoning issues. But what I've seen happen in Nantucket in the last few years is the activists get together and they say, we're going to make sure that the select board can't decide whether you have to put more sand in Sconset or not, whether you can put a stop sign on, on the road or not. I mean, it's ridiculous. And that's why I think because we have such a busy world these days, forget the pandemic, now it's impossible. People don't show up at these meetings and the only one that shows up are the activists have a specific point to make. And I remember John Gresher talked, I went to one of the town government study committee meetings and he said, you know, it, we are troubled by what happens because people come to the meeting, they have a specific issue. If that issue gets resolved early, they vote, they get their way, and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And they don't, have a, they don't even have a quorum to pass the financial <laughs> measures that come up later in the meeting. I mean, it's just, I don't think activists should be rewarded that way. There is one town on the Cape, I think it's Falmouth, right? Uh, Tucker, do you remember? That yeah. had, had that situation many years ago. A group of activists got together. They just outvoted. It was a small number of people attending. And they changed the destiny of the town. Falmouth got so upset about it, they went to the representative form of government. And now Falmouth has 238 representatives. Those are the ones that do all the voting. They represent all the people of Falmouth. When they looked at our, I'm trying to remember what the town government study committee said, Tucker, how many representatives we would have, maybe a hundred or whatever it might be, but they would represent every different part of our island. They would go to the meeting and in theory, the people in many areas are completely disenfranchised. I know Bill Sherman has, uh, has brought up the issue of, you know, the town employees are the ones who are here all year round and they will make these decisions. But if you have a wide enough selection, you know, there's always a plus and a minus with these things. It just seems to me to have a hundred people elected by a hundred different sectors of our island or areas of our island would, would provide a much better basis for having decisions made for the benefit of the entire island, not just an activist group. How, how would you feel, Gary, if uh, 51 of those 100 uh, uh, representatives in representative town meeting were the activists that have troubled your soul? <laughs> in other words, there's no way uh, in a democracy to assure against uh, people of a different persuasion uh, steering in a way that you're uncomfortable. One of the problems, uh, uh, Gary, is that uh, if you were to go with those 100 people, uh, they're going to be very parochial. They're going to be concerned about their area of the, the uh, island, and uh, everything else is going to be secondary. Uh, that's a concern when you have that type of representation, uh, something that we have to think about. That's right. But at least so there'll be 100. Right now, I know there's nobody represents Grand Point because there isn't a soul here in the winter. You know, there's probably five full-time residents in Grand Point, so nobody ever shows up at town meetings. Nobody ever goes to meetings. So there'd, at least there'd be someone representing each different area. And in theory, if we have 100 people being parochial, at the end of the day, they're going to have to make decisions because they only have one vote. And so that's how decisions get made in our democracy. We're not making them too good at the federal or state level these days either, by the way. So. <laughs> exactly. I have one question, um, if I could ask uh, Tucker. Yes, yes. Are there any other, I mean, how, what is the largest town in Massachusetts that has, still has a town meeting? 
like we do? Oh, golly, that's a great question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can answer that off the top of my head, but I, I can look into it for you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Anybody other questions for Tucker? He's done double duty today, and I really appreciate it. You get well. I I I, 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 I appreciate the opportunity to also have this discussion. I mean, it, this was very helpful to uh, hear your views here, which I will definitely bring back to the town government study committee. We're meeting again. I uh, I can't recall the date right off the top of my head, but it's sort of early to mid August is our next meeting, um, and I'll get that to you, Gary, just uh, for your Great. group's. Uh, knowledge. Um, but, you know, I think Peter, Peter said it very well in terms of um, educating people about, you know, what what they um, would be giving up, but also getting um, if we were looking at a, uh, call it more efficient and in some ways more accountable uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so you. uh, you're, you're welcome to stay, uh, Tucker, or you can move on now. I just wanted to talk to the other people on committee about, you know, I had sent that background memo. Uh, one of the most important issues we have is we need to get more representatives. Uh, we have three or four slots open on the committee, on the uh, advisory committee for non-voting taxpayers. And so if you remember the note that I put attached to the stuff I sent you, I was thinking that, how do we do this? We have to advertise. We don't have any money for an advertising budget. But just think about this. If one of you talented people want to draft a letter, you know, we, we ought to write a letter to the, the inky, you know, and maybe it could be posted in the letters to the editor during the summer season saying, you know, the town of Nantucket in its wisdom has reached out to try to make sure that they understand the interests and the wishes and the concerns of the seasonal population. And therefore they have put in place the advisory committee for non-voting taxpayers. And at the current time, uh, there are several openings on this committee. And some of you summer resident, uh, some of you seasonal residents may not be aware that this committee exists and may, may be interested in making your contribution to the knowledge that eventually we impart to the town with the relationship that we have on issues that affect the whole island. What, what do you think about that, Bill? You're on mute, Bill, unmute. Uh, excuse me, um, my thought is that the uh, letters to the editor reach more people than any other part of the uh, <laughs> INM, except maybe the front page. Uh, but there's always the question of uh, uh, Ms. Stanton's uh, discretion in printing a letter. That, that's so true. That's one way, but... Uh, yeah, but she might, but, you know, if, if it's a nice letter, just saying that, you know, we're interested in getting members on our committee so that our viewpoints can be presented to the select board from time to time. Bill? Gary? Yeah. Uh, I thought all of your suggestions for increasing our membership were terrific, and I thought I'd add one more. Um, each of the communities on the island, I don't know about town, but the outlying communities has a citizens association. I know we have one uh, out here in Quidnet Squam. I know Kath is involved with Tom Nevers, but it seems to me that uh, any one of us on the committee could take the responsibility to contact the, the chair or head of each of those communities and say, you know, what's the obvious? We need some contributions. Yes, Don? You're on mute, Don. You're on mute. Go ahead. No, you're still on mute. Uh, can I okay. In, uh, for Don? No, no. Oh, okay. I think I'm back. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I heard about this committee at a Rotary meeting. And there are actually many seasonal residents because they're Rotary members in other places. And since they have that sort of feeling of contributing to their communities, may be interested to join. So if yeah. one of us could uh, attend one of those meetings or ask to speak 
to the membership there, uh, perhaps you can garner some more members. I hope I'm deputizing all of you. I hope you all do that because many of you belong to community associations. And if you happen to have the opportunity at these community association meetings to say, by the way, I'm on this committee and I know that there are a few openings, you know, and we get to have very good visits from town officials to learn a lot about what's going on. And it would be helpful to you and for this community as well. And if some Specific and, uh, Peter, what do we tell them then? Sir, yeah. Yeah. No. could you repeat that? Yes. Uh, if someone in my village is interested yes. in serving on the committee, yes. what do I tell them to do? Uh, there's an application that uh, you have to fill out for the town. Uh, I can, we can get, we can send that to you. I mean, Eric will send it to you or any of us can get that application, you fill out the application because all of us have done it at one point, if you recall, to say why you'd like to be on the committee, to say I'm interested, we'd love the island and I'd like to help the island grow and succeed in all of its efforts. And I'm willing to spend, you know, a, a few hours every few weeks, you know, with these meetings, especially now. Where does that form go? Um, Libby. <laughs> Uh, to, to the assistant town manager. Erica, Erica Mooney. Yes, to Erica. If any of you have problems getting that application, let me know. I'll, I'll, um, I could have Erica send it. Frenzy and Nova. Frenzy and Nova. Yeah, Frenzy and Nova. Yeah, Frenzy and Nova. Yeah, Frenzy and Nova. I didn't hear that. Peter? I, okay, yeah, I was just going to, thinking about publicity and the inky, uh, I just wonder whether we ought not to uh, invite uh, this, per, what's her name, Stanton? Stanton? Yeah, uh, to to uh, talk to us, but we'd have to figure out what about. My guess is that a not insignificant percentage of her uh, readership are people who have annual subscriptions who are non-voting taxpayers. I certainly am one of them. And, and maybe, you know, we could just act as a sounding board as to what... Uh, paper and uh, things like that, because uh, it, it is kind of a um, weekly lifeline to what's going on up there. And we can, you know, show, tell, tell her how much we appreciate her and her paper and, and then perhaps uh, get a little bit more uh, space from her or something like that. Very interesting suggestion. We've never had that, Bill, have we? You no, know, never. No, but that is a good thought. Well, let me, let me remind you, Gary, I made the same suggestion last year. And one person on the committee who shall go unnamed interrupted me rudely and said, she's a so-and-so, we don't want that. Really? Yes, really. But I think it's an excellent suggestion too. I endorse it. That's a yeah. good and, idea. I, and let me just, I'm just mentioning because I remember Bill bringing it up last year. Yeah, it's a good idea. Good idea. By the way, you know, I said to Peter the other day, there was something that I found very interesting about our committee as you know, we schedule our meetings for the summer and stuff like that. And the last meeting we normally have is around Labor Day. And then I started thinking, I talked to Peter about this uh, a couple of days ago, and I said, you know, since we are all meeting virtually, right, these days, what limits us from meeting September, October, no, yeah, maybe once a month or something like that. Here we are always trying to say we can never get together and all these important things happen at the annual town meeting and we have no input on that because by the time the annual town meeting occurs in November, we're long since gone and we have no more meetings. But maybe we will have meetings. <laughs> and maybe, you know, so uh, we don't know whether or not the pandemic emergency rules will continue to be in effect through the rest of the year. Maybe all vaccine related. I think that uh, what Libby was saying that was that Libby was saying, I think that it will certainly go through this year. So I'm guessing we can continue through this year. Um, I, can I just ask two things? One, did I step out when we approved our agenda and our minutes? Did we do that? The minutes yeah, we as well approved as the agenda? Them. Yes, you Both did. of them. Okay. Yeah. And, Bill, um, yeah. and then the speakers that we have right now, just so everybody knows, 
is we uh, we invited the Department of Health guy Roberto Santa Maria for a next meeting, but he has not responded, so we currently don't have a confirmed speaker for the eighth. We have Rob McNeil for the twenty second, and then we have Denise Cronow from Finance. Um, Brian Turbot has not responded, but we at least have one person from Finance for the fifth. So. That's what we have for right now. We really need to get somebody confirmed for next next time. Yeah, I'm a little worried about next meeting just because Roberto is pretty occupied with the pandemic stuff. So I hope he'll be I, able to hope he'll be able to join us. Does anybody know him personally who could call him? Because he hasn't responded to my email and he doesn't know me. So yeah, is it perhaps somebody on the council like Matt Fee who, who do we have a council member who is kind of we're under that person or responsible for that person no, maybe no. We could... Remember last year we had uh, Christy came to one of our meetings last year and Jason Bridges came to one of our meetings in the past uh, by the way we never had Melissa Murphy at our meeting maybe we ought to invite her she's a new member of the select board and uh, she's never met with the Advisory Committee for Non-Voting Taxpayers. That, that would be a good idea. I've, I've watched some of these recent select board meetings and she seems to be an articulate yeah, thoughtful she's person. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what I was uh, suggest, uh, trying to say, maybe going through Libby uh, or going through somebody to encourage R Roberto, who may not even really know who we are, um, to at least respond uh, one way or the other. Uh, I've, I've written to him on other things and never get a response. Oh, okay. um, uh, and uh, so maybe uh, I'll try that. I'll try to do that first because otherwise we invite somebody else for the eighth and then he says yes, then what do we do? We have two yeah, speakers. Yeah. Yeah. We can have two speakers. Obviously, we had three today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, any other comments, thoughts? Um, what else? I forget what I put in all of those notes to you folks. But I, but anyway, it's we've been on the phone together or on the Zoom for an hour and forty-five minutes, and it's been a good meeting. I really appreciate everybody hanging in there. We got our resolution passed. Um, Peter, Kathy, and I will work on the wording. If anybody wants to be wordsmithing as well. Um, we can get you involved in that as well to finalize that letter to the select board. Do, do you want people in the you know next uh, week, let's say, if we're meeting in two weeks, to send to you or and to Kathy suge agenda suggestions uh, above and beyond uh, you know, the speaker? Absolutely. Don, look, Don made a very good suggestion last uh, last meeting, right? He said we should all have two or three things that each of us said we really like to focus on. Okay, and, and one of the ones I mentioned in one of my emails to you folks was that um, um, the, the, and, and Lou had a comment about this to me. Um, we, I live in Grand Point and a block away from Hobart and there is huge construction on Hobart during the summer. It is amazing to me that somehow they are permitted to demolish a house the big cranes and records going on on Hobart, uh, you know, a quarter of a block from uh, the the beach, you know, the lighthouse here in the middle of the high season. And I guess when I look at that and I see, you know, Toscano's trucks there, they have five trucks and five earth movers. And in the old days, you never could do that kind of construction during the high summer season. Are there no rules? And from what I'm told, you know, we, what Libby said to us last time, you know, and they start 7.30 in the morning, even 7.30 in the morning, you know, except for a Sunday, they have to start at 10 o'clock, 7.30 every morning till eight o'clock at night in season. Now, you know, the communities that I, uh, I'm in Florida and some of you, when you off, you know, in winter, there's no, there's none of that building goes on during the high season. And I put that in the notes that I sent to you that, you know, there's the three month period when the residents know and, so many of the, so much of the population of Nantucket are seasonal. Shouldn't there be some kind of rule in place like that? In the old days, people did it as a matter of courtesy. In the yeah. old days, you didn't. I think, it's, I think a lot of these were postponed uh, projects that couldn't take place right. at all. So they postponed them. I and mean, the Milestone Road is, is closed down to one lane every day. 
Why yeah. don't we just get a copy of the ordinance and discuss it and suggest some amendments to it? Yeah. In the old days, it just wasn't done. It wasn't done. Now, Lou, Lou sent me a note saying he thinks there is such a rule for right in town. I don't know. Maybe he's right about that. But, but I, I thought my wife, my wife said she thought some communities on the island have put in their own rules in effect. And I don't know how a community would be allowed to do that. But I was curious if anybody has heard about communities that have put in place area area that will come to mind would be Tom Nevers East. Maybe they put something in because they're uh, uh, a little bit different than the rest of uh, Tom Nevers. Yeah. yeah. I, I think Lou is correct that the uh, downtown, I don't know whether you call it the historical district or yeah. whatever, uh, does have a um, an ordinance and that, that would be, you know, a town or county ordinance. Yeah. yeah. No outside construction or something like that. Um, so that uh, during the height of the summer, uh, you're not tripping over construction sites uh, on the sidewalk and, and what have you. So we might start there by looking at and discussing whether or not it should be expanded uh, to other areas. Um, and, and if there are some other uh, community associations that have that kind of ruling, that would be interesting as well. Yeah. Okay, we'll do. We should us can do a little digging and see if we can find anything about that. I'll I'll do a little digging myself. Yeah, but but you're you're you politically, you know, you we want to figure out where we want to take our shots because uh, one of the main industries on the island is construction, and you'd be uh, taking on the significant portion of the money making uh, effort of the island uh, during building season. My understanding was they would still be able to work in the Historic District Commission, but they would have to work inside, not outside. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my understanding too. By the way, speaking of political issues, uh, you know, Don had some conversation with the people at ACT. Somehow, I'm, you might, I'm on a mailing list. I get the ACT Now stuff, and they are really beating on short-term rentals. And uh, there are, it's a political issue, I guess, because... Uh, a lot of people feel, and now with the pandemic, you know, short-term rentals are very threatening to a lot of people. And of course, they didn't permit them until phase two or whatever it was. But if you read any of these things from Act Now, they are on a rampage and they write, have you, have you folks all seen some of their materials? Yeah. No. Okay, I ought to, I'll send them to you. Uh, they have a they have sent out about eight aggressive emails and have a white paper on why short-term rentals should not be allowed. And uh, I happen to think that it's kind of a problem myself, but, but I know the real estate industry seems to have thrived on it in the past. But um, that's why when I'm looking at the statistics of who our constituents are, I start with the fact that there's a zillion, you know, 17,000, 15,000 residents, 9,000 voters. And then I say, well, maybe if I call the tax collector, I'll find out how many people pay taxes. That's the first section. Second question is, how many people pay taxes less 20%? Those are the residents, okay? And that says, I'm trying to find out who our constituents are. Who are the non-voting taxpayers? How many are we? And the best way I can find out is to find out what the total number of taxpayers and then subtract from that the total number of residents who can be identified by the fact that they all pay 20% less than all of us. But that'll give us the people paying full taxes, real estate taxes, but it doesn't give us the exact number because some of us own more than one building and a lot of people in town own, you know, two houses or three houses or whatever. So the number of taxpayers um, may not be such an easy, but that's really who our constituency, I have to do a little more work. I was thinking of contacting the NATA, Nantuck, Nantucket Data Project. I know Alan Warden, and they're, they're doing all of these statistics for the town. Maybe they can identify that for us. Well, it could be that, that the non-voting taxpayers would not be in favor of preventing short-term rentals because 
it, it th those presumably are ho unoccupied houses, people who do not live in those houses who are renting them out. And uh, no, that's interesting. Years. Some of us are like, look, yeah. we're non voting tax. And I'm not interested in having people move, come in every week. It's a turnover on Saturdays and a bunch of you know, noisy folks dragging their stuff in, in and out and, you know, without knowing people but not wearing masks. We see new families come in. They don't know about our rules. They come off the ferry and, you know, and then they're gone in a week. And actors, I'll send you the stuff. It's quite, um, they're, they're, they're really- Well, we, have, we allow short-term rentals in our home. We have not had any problems. Yeah. We, had very, we were very strict about who we allow in. So well, a lot um, of people on the island do that, Kathy. As right. we know. And so a lot of people would say, of course, we want to be able to do that. But I'll send you the stuff from Mac now. You'll see there. They're on the warpath. Anyway, it's almost 12 o'clock. You guys have been great. I really appreciate everybody participating. And hopefully, Kathy will figure out who's going to speak at our next meeting. You're on the case with Roberto. And maybe we can get, the, if he can't, maybe Melissa can come talk to us at the meeting. That would be great. And, we're, and nobody's going to draft a letter to the INM. Is that right? It was, it was just a, an idea. Well, let's see. Who, 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 who would like to take that on? Would you, I mean, I'll start, a, I'll start a draft and I'll just circulate it and you guys can. I'd take I'll be happy to, uh, you know, take up your first draft and okay. add, add to it if it needs to. I'll send it around and, uh, you know. Okay. okay. Thank you all for participating. Have a nice, safe week <laughs> a week yeah move to adjourn take care bye bye <laughs> thank you thank you hope, hope everything goes stay, stay safe thank you right now.